This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center at NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله In the name of Allah the gracious the merciful all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the universe, the master of the day of judgment. I bear witness and testimony to the oneness of Allah, to his magnificence, his omnipotence, his might, his glory, to his being the creator and sustainer of all things, the giver of life, the guide of hearts, the master of the day of judgment. And I bear witness to the fact that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a servant and final messenger. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. In Surah al Furqan, we have mention of a category of unique individuals, specific in their relationship to Allah azawajal. They're called the Ibad al-Rahman, may Allah make us from amongst them. These are individuals who recognize the parameters through which they want to engage the divine in a mode that individually you and I can only decide for ourselves how we want to implement into our own existence the characteristics that they are identified with. We talked about many of these characteristics over the last weeks, but to go back to the base that all of us fundamentally in existence are out. That by definition, it's not just the way we translate that you are a servant, but you are an abd because you rely on something for your existence. That's what an abd is. And Allah Azawajal uniquely is Rabb because He alone Azawajal does not rely on anything to exist. He is Ghani. So anything and everything that necessitates something else in order to be is an Abd. And you can narrow this now down to choosing to be an Abd of Allah rather than being an Abd of the dunya, chasing after materialistic wealth which is never going to create satiation. And out of the physical, beauty, externals, that will have you as you age, die a thousand deaths, as you can't deal with the fact that this body is merely a vessel for a soul that is meant to move forward, but this is going to remain. There's so many things other that we orient ourselves consciously or unconsciously as a prism and direction of what it is that we become subservient to. And the Ibad al-Rahman, they have not only chosen to willfully be those who submit to the Divine, but they're recognized as being the Ibad in particular of al-Rahman, the most merciful of those who show mercy, the source of compassion and love, gentleness, kindness, softness. The characteristics that we've looked at thus far, that these Ibad rahman they're defined as الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَ They walk on the earth with humility and grace. And that when they are spoken to by the Jahilun, the people who are not utilizing their akal, but the ones who are engaged from a different part of themselves in their interaction, the Ibad rahman when they deal with the ignorant, they simply say, Salama, peace. They're the ones, الَّذِينَ يَبِدُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا That they use a part of the night to be for their Lord in prostration in Qiyam. They're the ones that make dua to Allah, as the verses continue, to have them be taken away from the adab, the punishment of the hellfire. And as the verses continue now, we get yet another category. 
that you can break it down into four broader categories, but there are sub-characteristics in each verse. In this verse now it says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَنْفَقُوا That they are those who, when they give up their wealth, they spend. لَمْ يَسْرِفُوا They don't do it with extravagance or excess. وَلَمْ يَقْتَرُوا And they don't do it with stinginess or miserliness. But instead, they are what? كَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا They're the ones who are in between those things, firm, standing, literally. May Allah make us from amongst them. You've likely heard in numerous gatherings like this the importance of having a recognition of where you give your wealth. But to be able to understand what this verse is talking to us about, it creates now two polar extremes. That you are engaged in israf, that you are just spending superfluously with no benefit to it. Or you're on the other end of it that you hoard wealth. And it's telling us now that you want to be in the middle of these two extremes. This is actually about responsible spending of what's been allocated to you. And to understand that the recognition of what these terms mean, yasrifu, yaktaru, there's not a baseline definition given because in terms of what we possess of the world, everybody has something different. The allocation comes from the divine and his hikmah. He is ahkam al hakimin, the most wise of those who have wisdom. I don't know why some people have millions of dollars and some people don't have any dollars at all. But I'm not the one that determines who gets what. The idea though within this is to understand that individually I now have a relationship to the allocation that's been given to me and I want to have just like in every other facet of my relationship to this existence presence and mindfulness in the spending of my wealth. Why is this critical to understand? Well, in the moment that you and I live, which is very distinct from when this verse is revealed, where wealth in and of itself is actually attached to something. You have tender that is rooted in something like gold or silver. This is why when we are looking at our hadith, and it talks about the zakat al-fitr, for example. It talks about the end charity at Ramadan. There's narrations that give us insight into bags of different kind of commodities. Because there's an actual thing attached to your wealth. When people sit and they engage in conversation about cryptocurrencies and it's in one direction or the other, fundamentally it functions in the same way as a dollar. Because the dollar is not actually attached to anything, just like this is not attached to something in specific. Whereas when this verse is revealed, you have a coin made of gold that is worth something. You have something that is attached to wealth that is not just rooted in an intangible concept. And where you and I are today in existence, most of you don't even carry wallets in your pocket anymore. You're in a place where there's such ease exerted in your spending that the aspect of being mindful of it gets so much diluted. Because you can have a piece of plastic in your pocket and you don't even have to go to a cash register today. It literally just reads it and says, throw whatever you want in the basket. You can get to a place where you take your phone, which you're mindlessly engaged in. Subjective fact. You want to tell me that you spend hours on social media or watching YouTube clip after YouTube clip with presence of your heart in your mind? I'm going to tell you as your brother, you're lying to yourself. And then that same phone is what you just stick on another apparatus to make a payment for something where there's no understanding of what the transaction is actually yielding. And the strategy that's there is to dilute mindfulness. To be in a space where you have a sharp contrast to what our tradition teaches us. The most people who practice this faith, which is remarkable how generous Muslims are. Every single year where we go through campaign after campaign, I tell anybody who listens to me, which is a lot less people than you might think, <laughs> that I can't imagine just how generous 
people of this faith actually are. Mashallah. We talk about humanity on a whole, and you contrast, though, individual experiences that are also applicable to Muslims. There's a certain mindlessness to spending when it comes to feeding the self. And a very particularity when it comes to now giving to alleviate somebody else's needs. That nobody's going to say that hunger is okay. And may Allah protect us from ever being those who have to experience hunger in order to understand what it really means to be hungry. But when you start to then ask, well, why don't people have food in the first place? Or maybe I have to let go of some of my privilege that allows for me to have what I have, but necessitates then indirectly or directly somebody having less. People have a thousand reasons as to why I don't have enough for me to also give to you. And you don't want to adopt that as a mindset. The mechanisms and systems that are in play necessitate an absence of consciousness. To go to a place where everything exists in this virtual mode. You don't even have to look at a bill that you pay today. You can just put it on auto pay. You don't even have to be in a space where you make payments on debts that you owe. You just constantly push it and push it and push it. In a state of denial. As if you are in a relationship with somebody that you don't want to own up to the actual challenges that exist. Until it suddenly implodes in your face and there's nowhere else to go other than the avoidance of conflict and reality renders for me the spot that I'm in right now. The Ibad al-Rahman, they're present and they're spending. They're in a space where they have mindfulness in this arena. Somebody might say to you that Israf in and of itself is something that is about, you don't go and buy fancy things. It's not what it is. You want to conceptualize for yourself, because we have other hadith that talk about extravagance in food consumption, extravagance in clothes that you wear. It also talks about extravagance in things like utilizing water for wudu. Don't waste water, the Prophet says. In the Qur'an it tells us that the people of Israf, they're companions of shaitan, may Allah protect us from it. But I want you to utilize this now as an example. That I'm an individual who's standing to make my wudu. I turn on the faucet, and then I take off my shoes and my socks. And then I roll up my sleeves. And then I look at myself in the mirror a little bit, just to make sure that I look the way that I thought I looked from the last time I looked at myself two minutes ago. In all of that time, the water's just going down the drain. That's Israf. It didn't do anything for anybody. If Allah blessed you with millions of dollars or dozens of dollars or you don't have any dollars in your pockets, understand that Israf is subjective to you. You don't want to, in futility, just let the water fall. It's not giving you anything, it's not giving anybody else anything, and it's not the fact that you're not gaining from it, but you used it without gain for anybody. What a pointless way of spending a resource. That it could have been something that brought benefit to somebody else. It's not a conversation that's only applicable to those who are in higher levels of affluence. This is not a deen that says that having wealth is in and of itself a problem. It is a deen that tells you that straight, the poor person is likely going to enter Jannah with more ease than the rich person. Why? You don't have wealth? You don't have to give zakah. You have wealth? There's ritual incumbent upon you based off of what you have categorically that somebody else does not have. You have more responsibility now. If I don't have it, I'm not responsible for it. But the person who does, they bear different understanding of responsibility. It applies differently to them. So you don't want to narrow or myopically say, the guy that's driving that car or lives in that house, that's who this verse is talking about. But to look back within myself and to understand what informs my spending. And on the other end of it as well. 
You can't open up one of these without there being some type of notification that's asking you to buy something. From the minute you wake up until the minute you walk out of your home, there's marketing, advertising that is purposely driven to tell you to consume, consume, consume. In Surah Al-Takawthir, this is what the verses say. Al-Hakum Al-Takawthir, that you are distracted. Allah is telling you. In the competing of just piling up things of the world. And you're going to have it, the next verse says, until you go and visit the graves. And that can be fundamentally that I am leaving this world and transitioning into another state of existence. May Allah make the best of our deeds the last of our deeds. And not let any one of us leave this world other than in a state that's pleasing to Him. Or also just fundamentally, I understand that in our tradition there's an importance that I recognize the reality of death by going to be present at the burials of others or to go and visit the graves. So it gives me a wake-up call. Most of the stuff that I chase after is not going with me. That diversion now is about me thinking, why do I see things the way that I see them? Why fundamentally is my perspective the way that I understand things to be? I am bombarded constantly and consistently. We don't have a regular TV kind of station system in my house. I don't know if people still do or not. But we have Netflix and Disney Plus and Hulu, but not regular TV with commercials that every 10, 15 minutes, you have three minutes of bombardment to just buy this, buy this, buy this. So when we go on vacation and my kids turn the television on, they're now watching all kinds of things that they've never seen. My son Kareem is six, my daughter Medina is nine. They're beautiful. Make dua for them. They're the most amazing blessings in my life. May Allah grant ease to all those who are seeking children in their lives. And may Allah bring us to a place who we have children, that we are good parents to our children. My six-year-old stares at this thing of fixated. And I come out of the hotel bedroom into the place where the television is, or I come upon him, and I'm, what are you watching? He's like, Baba, you have to get a Verizon phone. <laughs> like, what are you talking about, Kareem? And then my daughter is sitting next to him, and there's another commercial that comes on where people are laughing and playing and dancing to some kind of medication that has to deal with stomach diarrhea. And she says to me, Baba, what does this have to do with this? This has got nothing to do with it. But it's trying to get you to a place where it's teaching you two things. Your happiness is rooted in buying what we're selling to you. And in order for you to buy into that, Point number two, what you have right now is not enough. It is inadequate. It is deficient. Most people, generalization that I'm comfortable making, are spending money that they don't have on things that they simply do not need. In the Ibad al-Rahman, categorically, they see it differently. Surah al-Furqan is telling us. You're not distracted by the false realities of the dunya. But you wake up a little bit and say, I want to see it differently. Then I start to think within myself, why do I see it the way that I see it to begin with? What is it that's given me an insight that my validation has to be rooted in these externals? What is it that gives me a perspective on life that says I have to keep buying and keep buying and keep consuming and keep consuming? It doesn't have to be that case. It doesn't have to be in the frame of existence in that way. You have prophets of God like Suleiman salam who were kings of kingdoms. You have our Prophet وسلم, who when he was given the choice of being in a state of poverty as such or in a state where he was given dominion similar, he chose to not have so much. The notion cannot exist in an elementary way 
that makes it simplistic and says that it's only these people who are of this background. It's a subjective conversation. Why are you spending on what you spend on? And why aren't you giving in the ways that you have ability to give? And nobody can make that decision other than you. Do I really need to have this thing in addition to this other thing and that other thing and the other thing that I don't even know that I had until I started thinking about this thing that I wanted to buy? That I have so many things that I forget what I have. When we start to identify more deeply and have definition, it's off some of the opinions that we are taught that when you spend for the sake of the divine, that's never Israf. But when you spend on that which is impermissible, that is always wasted spending. You don't want to validate it in a pursuit of an unsatiable want, the expense of real needs. And at any juncture in the life that you find yourself in, it becomes one of the obligatory buckets of knowledge to know how Sharia applies to you. That you got to know your fardain, prayer your prayer, because I'm not praying yours as much as you're not praying mine. A foundational block of theology. You got to know who you're praying to. You have to know, thirdly, foundational purification of the inward. How to take care of your heart. The world at times is heavy. You don't know how to take care of your inside. It's going to be that much more painful. And then fourth, relevant to this, as you go through phases of your life, you have to know how Sharia applies to you. So if you're a doctor, what does Sharia mean to a doctor? I'm not a doctor. I don't need to know it. It's not obligatory upon me. You are an academic, an activist, an artist. You are a scientist, an entrepreneur. You need to know these things. And so too, in the prism of where and how you have relationship to this fundamental thing, it's not going away because so much of this world is moved and motivated to make decisions in pursuit of a desire that is fundamentally valuing profits over people. And you got to think about how do I fit into this and am I in a place where psychologically I've been shackled that the worth that I have is for me to be able to brandish a certain logo upon my body which is where I find my honor and dignity in something else. And nobody can make that decision for you. Greed is not about a Scrooge type stereotype that I'm sitting and thinking about how it is that when the blind man that's asking for wealth is looking in the other way, I'm just going to pour my hand into his bucket and take his money. But you want to juxtapose it to a foundational value in our tradition, which is gratitude. A recognition of what I have. What it is that's been given to me. And to juxtapose it to a definition of greed that is rooted in a question that says to you, how much is actually enough for you? And it's going to permeate every part of your lived existence. If you don't know how much is enough for you, then when you get older and you get that marriage that you want and you get those kids that you want and you're still chasing after something, somebody else is going to watch your babies do amazing things because you're chasing after money. If you don't have an answer to what is enough, you're going to be complicit in inequity and injustice that necessitates others having much less than they could forthright have so that I could have what it is that I simply want, not even need. When is enough enough? You're going to give up some of the best years of your life when you are strongest, most creative, have the most energy to be in a place that you validate the pursuit of something that you might not ever even use in the course of your worldly existence. And then get to an age where many elders do that say, 
why did I work so hard for something that I really have no gain from at the end of the day? When is it enough? It's built purposefully to have you believe that what you have is somehow inadequate. And it starts to permeate consciousness. The example I like to use is when I take my two kids to go and get ice cream from a Baskin Robbins. They walk into the ice cream store, they see all of the ice creams that are there, they look at every single one, read each name out loud, ask the other which one you're going to get. Both of them are going to get vanilla with sprinkles at the end of it. And then they sit down and they say, Baba, can I try yours? Do you want to try mine? And over the course of it, there's smiles, there's laughter, but there's always, multiple times, maybe I should have gotten one of the other ones. You can't enjoy what you have if your mind is telling you that it's not as good as what something else might have been. <laughs> you got to own up to the reality that literally you are built in a consumer-driven society that is purposely seeking to give rise to a feeling of entitlement. Why do you have to walk into a store and somebody writes your name on the cup of coffee that was made exactly the way you wanted it? You don't even know the name of the person that made it for you. The options are set to be a sense of liberation, that you can choose, but when there's more choice, it's purposeful to make you doubt what you have. This is why some of you and some of your friends, whether you want to admit it or not, are not able to stay committed in relationships to the women that you meet because you are constantly wondering if somebody else is going to be something different for you. Disrupting the fundamental unit that exists within our religious community of a family. The same way my kids are wondering if a different ice cream is better, you are given a gift and an opportunity of building a life with someone, but you're playing games because when you're with them, you're thinking about maybe somebody else is going to give me something different. You fundamentally just don't know what you need. Because it's just about the fulfillment of wants. When you don't believe in an afterlife, that's all that you have. When there's not a sense that there's an akhira, something that's bigger than this, then all I'm going to be able to tell people is, well, go get yours as much as you can, because this is it. The Ibad rahman they don't think that way. They don't see the world that way. Food for one is enough for two. Food for two is enough for four. When you give, Allah is going to always give you back many fold. You got to believe it. And an understanding and a recognition that at the end of all of it, this worldly existence is going to be a drop in the bucket in terms of what's going to come next. But I just started thinking about it. And so here is a fourth category of the Ibad al Rahman. Allah is telling us that there are those who, when they spend, they don't spend in extravagance or excess. It's subjective to you. Don't live beyond your means. They're not stingy. Give when you have capacity to give. They understand that where they should be is in the middle of those two things. We live in a society where minorities historically, systems rooted in anti-blackness, are purposely built to create debt structures so that communities of color are not able to grow. If you are constantly in a place where you have to be worried about that payment and the interest on the payment and so much more, you get to a place where decisions are in a state where again the mindfulness is not there. Now wake up one morning and I look to see that all I'm passing on to those that come after me is a shackle of debt that I didn't have to get into necessarily in the first place. I'm not leaving behind something to build upon. But I'm leaving behind the same anxieties that I carry forward. 
don't want to be in the place where you deepen in a reflection of the verse that is part of the processes, the systems that create that kind of living for people. You don't want to validate and justify the pursuit of professional ambition that further structures systemically that necessitate people living shackled in debt in order for others to thrive. This is not a dean that tells us to strive in pursuit of inequity. It acknowledges that there are going to be people who have certain things and others who don't have those things. But it understands that our drive is to be cultivating social equity as best as we can. This is what you want to start to think about. These characteristics of the Ibad al-Rahman given for my benefit, your benefit. Who do I want to be, man? And the transition now from just knowing something to acting upon what it is that I know. Think about the relationship you have to your wealth. Think about who taught you about spending. There's a reason why when you go to school in this country that they do not teach you about how to open a bank account, how to have a budget, how to manage your wealth. As you start to do those things now, you start to think and reflect upon the things that I have. How do I engage them with gratitude? I don't get bombarded and subservient to a marketing agenda that teaches me that my contentment is rooted in the purchase of what it is that they're trying to sell to me. Contentment comes from within. That true richness is not having an abundance of things of the earth, but true richness is having the richness of your soul. It doesn't come from simply the acquisition of the material, but recognizing that it's a means to understand something at a deeper level. So use this day of Joma, reflect on these verses, and then strive to think about how it is that I can implement it in the course of my life, because it's a subjective decision. You don't want to be washing it down the faucet with no benefit, because then you're not gaining, nobody else is gaining, you're going to stand in front of Allah and He's going to say, I gave it to you. I literally gave it to you. Why did you use it like this? You're going to have to have an answer to that question. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah will grant us ease in that moment and throughout the rest of our time in this world. In Alhamdulillah, 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 Please have everyone move up a bit uh, so people can be a little more comfortable. You don't have to sit too tight to each other, but you can just scooch up so people will continue to trickle in. Inshallah ta'ala, next Friday, uh, the IC is going to be hosting iftar for the day of Arafah. It's the ninth of the Hijjah, arguably the most auspicious day on our calendar, if not one of them. So you want to use these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah that are Mubarak days to do good things, engage in good acts. You want to complete your fara'id, you want to avoid the haram, because there's an exponential benefit in doing what is right, but it, similarly it's magnified in moments of barakah that when you do wrong, they're going to also be that much more impactful. May Allah protect us from it. The ninth of the Hijjah is a day that's recommended to fast if you're able to. These days leading into it are also days that if you can fast, you should. 
He turned to your friends, asked them if they want to make suhoor with you over the course of the weekend. You don't need it to be always organized. Just turn to a few people and say, let's do this on this long day, weekend, where there's three days off in a row. You can host iftars and tell people to come to them. But if you're in this area next Friday, try to join us for a thought. On Saturday, we're going to be hosting Eid prayers, uh, and they'll be in the building next door on the 10th floor. Rain is projected that day. And so let others know that they can join us, and you all join us as well. We'll be doing it on Saturday as per the Sunni tradition. On Sunday, we'll be hosting Eid prayers with Sheikh Fiaz Jafar, and those will be in this building as well. And that will be in accordance with the Shi'i tradition. You can go to both services. There's going to be brunch at both. So if you want to have brunch both days, then go to both things. But if you can please go to our website, just RSVP, so we can calculate accordingly. Uh, if you were here for Eid after Ramadan, you saw that the room was overflowing. There's that many more who wanted to join us but couldn't. If you know others who don't have screener access, encourage them to do that from now. Because on Eid after Ramadan, we had many people who were just in the lobby trying to join at that time, and at that point it's just very late to do so. We have a campaign running for Sudan where we're putting it out on our list today. The Udhiya, the Qurbani, uh, the ritual slaughter that's associated with the Eid al-Adha in the Abrahamic narrative and tradition in our religion. We're distributing and encouraging our community to give. It's $100 for one share, and it'll feed up to 10 families. They have another program that's called Qurbani Plus that we're also encouraging that will fulfill the Udhiya, but for $250 will also provide three livestock to a family that is run by a widow, a survivor of abuse, they will use those three livestock for their own financial empowerment and income generation. In the coming year, Islamic Relief is uh, committed to purchasing from them also those animals for the Udhiya, so that it's creating for them a means to also break out of some of the cyclical challenges that they're facing. And so that's at launchgood.com slash ICNYU, the number four Sudan. Please give it. And don't get lost in the idea of, well, is it an option? Is it recommended? What's its legal category? I've been in refugee camps before where people have told me, leading into the day of Eid, fleeing genocide and ethnic cleansing, and they've eaten rice every day for 10 months in a row. And I'll say, what is it that you're hoping? And they'll say, for my children, I really hope on the day of Eid, I can give them some meat to eat, just a taste of something. And I've had relief agencies say to me that when they ask you this or tell you this, don't commit to them. We don't want them to feel bad because we think we'll have it, but it really depends if people back home are going to actually do the udhya or not. So try to do it. Give what you can. If you can't do a whole one, $50 will help five families be fed. You can do the math and just proportion it out. But it'll go a long way, not just in giving food to somebody, but helping somebody realize that they're not forgotten, that somebody's remembering them. And when you're in that kind of situation where hunger is not voluntary, like you will fast on the day of Arafah, where you don't have a choice, you're just hungry all the time. It makes a huge difference when you're in a space where you feel like somebody notices what you're going through. So try your best to do that. Then the last campaign that we're running is uh, with an organization called Khair Giver that brings toys on the day of Eid to children who are hospitalized, pediatric children. You can find uh, info on that as well. Uh, the toys are $3, $4, $10, whatever you can give to that. We'll continue to send it out, inshallah. Just a few quick announcements. Our sister uh, Dua requests, our sister Noura Tamara Youssef, uh, passed away at the young age of 31 years old. Uh, she's the younger sister of Basama Yusuf, who's a member of our community. You can please keep her in your du'as. Uh, and our sister Ashley Christine Scott, uh, two of her mentors and her father have also passed away. Ashley is also a member of our community. You made du'a for both Basama, Ashley, and their loved ones that 
Allah showers his infinite mudra upon the deceased, grants them peace in the grave and entrance into Jannah without any judgment. Um, our sister Reach Khan, her uncle Abdul Malik, is in a coma right now in the village of Bafa. Her brother Zaid Karim, his grandmother Zubaydah Karim, is ill. And Yael Shai, who is a former director of spiritual life here that many of you have likely seen, if you don't know by name, you'll know by face. Uh, she's a good friend and supporter of our community. Her stepsister, Layla Billick, is in the ICU with a brain tumor. Uh, they've asked if we can make du'a for them. I just wanted you to think about this also, right? Yael is not Muslim, but she believes in the power that our prayer would have to heal her sister. And she asks, please let your community know. And that's the kind of impact you all have on other people. If you can't recognize your own goodness, then take it from the reality of those who are requesting of you. Please make dua that Allah makes these ailments a means of purification in this world and a means of elevation in the next, and dance them with complete healing and shifa. Uh, our brother Anwar Haq, uh, his sister Armina, went into labor last night uh, and potentially has already given birth, if not will give birth soon, to his niece, their daughter, Amal. Uh, he's asked that we make special du'a for both child, mother, parents. Uh, please make du'a that Allah grants them uh, only the best in this world and the best in the next. Uh, we had a member of our community uh, who will be induced for labor on Monday. And it's an early induction and the baby is going to be on the smaller side of five pounds and three ounces. And she's asked also if we can make du'a for her delivery and well-being, inshallah. In Allah, wa malaika zahu, saluna ala nabi, ya ayyuhal nadina amanu, salu alayhi wa salimu tasina. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil awaleen wa fil akhirin. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallama ya arhamar rahimin. اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فافو عنا يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم جعلنا من المخلصين اللهم جعلنا من المخلصين اللهم جعلنا من المخلصين We begin this supplication in your name, Ya Allah, and beseech you to send your choicest salutations upon your most beloved صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم we ask that you shower your infinite mercy upon this gathering, granting each and every one who is present here in and our loved ones only the best in this world and the best in the next. We ask, Ya Allah, that if all of us are meant to be together only at this time, at this place, whether we are young or old, male or female, regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our social class, our country of origin, our cultural heritage, whether we are Muslim or come from a different walk of life, Ya Rabbi, if our individual hearts are meant to be in the presence of all of their hearts that are gathered here, only at this time, at this place, and gather us all together again in the best of places in the world beyond this one. Increase us, Ya Allah, in all that is good. Make us from amongst those who benefit from these blessed days of the Hijjah. Give us the strength to take advantage of all of the things that are open to us for our taking, in terms of barakah, in terms of increase in terms of tawfiq, in terms of success. Let not any one of us end these blessed days without exiting them in a state better than which we found them. Help us, Ya Rabbi, to be able to take from the blessed day of Arafah as much as we can. <coughs> Give us the tawfiq to have our du'as accepted and answered on that day. Let the day of our Eid be a day that is filled with joy and celebration for all of us. Let not any one of us be a reason as to why someone else is alone on that day of Eve. Let not any one of us be by ourselves, but they send many to us who would say to us, come and spend this holiday with us and our families, our friends, and our home. Help us, Ya Rabbi, to take from it all that we can and help us to be a means for others to gain as well. Give us the means, the sincerity, to perform our uthiyah, the qurbani, the true sense of sacrifice that you have intended for it, for us. And put barakah into that given, Ya Rabb, so that those who are given that food, at the end of it, the beneficiary, 
that is not just their stomachs that are filled by that act, Ya Allah, but put such sincerity into our giving that their hearts are filled because they know and feel the love that we have for them, the concern that we have for them, that even where everyone else might have forgotten them, we remember them, Ya Allah, and we recognize our ability to be a source of hope for them, a source of healing for them, a source through which they feel and experience your mercy, your love, your generosity. Ya Allah, bless this community always. And make us a source of benefit for your creation. <laughs> Protect us from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. A special dua, Ya Rabbi, for our sister Hana, who has been working at this center for many years. And today is her last day here on our staff as she moves forward to pursue her graduate studies. We ask Ya Rabbi, that in whatever way we possibly can to help her know truly how grateful we are for all that she's done for this community and that we wish for her nothing less than the best in this world and the best in the next. But grant her success and tawfiq in all of her endeavors and give her the ultimate success in the highest levels of your Jannah and the world beyond this one. And for all those who are leaving this community for any reason, moving to other cities, finding themselves in evolution of just their life in this world that brings them to other countries. Let them all know that this is a place for them always, and that there will always be people here who are remembering them, making dua for them, for no other reason that we love them. رَبَّنَا تَقَرَّ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيُّ الْعَلِيمُ وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا يَا مَوْلَعَنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. If you like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org/donate. For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org/classes. If you have any questions, email us at info@icnyu.org. At